الحمد لله حمد الشاكرين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها ونور الأبصار وضيائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد Today's important discussion relating to the war on terror 20 years on, the Taliban movement and the black banners, many people have requested and demanded from me to give my thoughts with regard to the Kabul takeover by the Taliban movement uh, recently as well as the implications relating to Ashratu Sa'ad, the signs of the end of times, and Akhiru Zaman, the end of times and the period of time that we live in, which is the period of time between Al Fitnatul Rabi'ah, the fourth tribulation, and the drying up of the Euphrates River and the uncovering of the gold depository, as prophesied by Sayyiduna Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Now, the first segment of my discussion relates to the war on terror 20 years on. In 2001, on September the 11th, the two twin towers were attacked by Al Qaeda, as claimed by the American government and the American intelligence. As a result, America carried out its so-called war on terror and George Bush warned of divine justice implicating therefore that the, the foreign policy carried out by America is in fact a divine justice that he will carry out um, for the atrocities that occurred uh, on September the 11th, 2001. This resulted in the invasion of Afghanistan in October 2001 and then an invasion of Iraq even though <coughs> Saddam Hussein was totally unconnected to Al-Qaeda. There was no connection between Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda. He did not host any of Al-Qaeda uh, cells or Al-Qaeda members, prominent figures from within Al-Qaeda. In fact, I remember in 2001, when while performing Hajj, there was rumors <coughs> on famous news channels like the CNN that Al-Qaeda members will be attending the Hajj. So the, the way today war is waged against an invisible enemy, which is COVID-19. In that time, war was being waged against alleged members of Al-Qaeda uh, dispersed throughout the Muslim world. So the claim was even made that Al-Qaeda members have infiltrated the Hajj, therefore giving um, justification for any foreign policy relating to intrusion within uh, the Hajj or anything else. Even though Saudi Arabia, most of the uh, people who carried out the 9-11 attacks were Saudi citizens. No action was taken against Saudi Arabia. Action was taken against Afghanistan at the time, which happened to be ruled by Taliban. And Taliban at the time, I remember uh, the spokesman for Taliban stating that we are willing to give over uh, Osama bin Laden with a few conditions that he be trialed on, uh, in an international court. Words to that effect. Nevertheless, Afghanistan was invaded and America exporting its democracy, its form of democracy, uh, under the guise of women's rights and giving rights to women, uh, made alliances with unsavory characters like Dostum. Dostum, who is known for his uh, human rights abuses, war crimes, making ditches and then placing his enemies within the ditches and then smacking hammers over their heads and killing them or placing people in containers until they die of exhaustion and overheating. Uh, such type of 
unsavory characters became a part of what was known at that time as the Northern Alliance, Shamaili Ittihad. Shamaili Ittihad was a conglomerate of all these unsavory characters, barbaric individuals <coughs> who united against this movement known as Taliban, which started in the mid-90s with Mullah Umar. Now, Mullah Umar was the founder of Taliban, but we know Taliban was supported by Pakistan and the ISI, and for good reason too, to protect the borders of Pakistan from any type of infiltration uh, from foreign aggression or exploitation of uh, raw Indian intelligence or any um, meddling in the area at the hands of the Indian intelligence. So when uh, Afghanistan was invaded in 2001, George Bush famously declared that you are either with us or you are with the enemy. So Pakistan went on a back foot with, under the leadership of uh, Pervez Musharraf, who is still alive, and America was given bases like they had been given in the past in 1979 to 1989 to fight Russia. And as General Hamid Gul famously stated, uh, that Russia was defeated at the hands of Pakistan and America, and soon America will be defeated at the hands of America and Pakistan. Whatever the statement was, nevertheless, history has uh, unfolded and unpackaged these realities that today America has left Afghanistan. But the war on terror had greater implications and ramifications across the globe. For instance, here in the UK, hate crime increased, Islamophobia increased. In America, Muslims were unsafe in certain parts, certain states. Within white dominated areas and the Western world, um, Islamophobia has increased, especially within mainland Europe. Europe is known for its xenophobic attitude and its Nazi roots, meaning uh, Nazism hasn't actually finished in Europe since Hitler. Uh, we know that through observing the policies of the French government today. But the 9-11 attacks were an impetus for the growth of Islamophobia, even though Al-Qaeda network had its roots within uh, the 79 to 89 war when Al-Qaeda was founded by Osama bin Laden and his cohorts. But additionally, America and the CIA played a major role in supporting uh, the Mujahideen in 79 to 89. Now, over a million Afghanis died fighting the Soviet Union and around 15,000 Russian soldiers died. And it was declared a victory for the Afghani people and a victory for the American government. And America left uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan uh, victorious. But then they entered the same area that they had left, uh, in fact, abandoned from 1989. So they abandoned the area for around 12 years, allowed various groups to fester within Afghanistan after leaving weaponry they had such they had given the CIA had given anti-aircraft missiles to the Mujahideen they had left so many weapons in that region that the warring factions were fighting one another until the rise of the Taliban in the mid 90s and even the critics of Taliban will admit that they did restore some segment uh, uh, a modicum of law and order within Afghanistan during their five-year rule from uh, 96 when they conquered Kabul up to 2001. So the war on terror in 2001 uh, continued for 20 years. Uh, America established its bases in Helmand, the Helmand province, and the famous bombardments of the Tora Bora mountains fighting uh, these tribesmen. And the Taliban kept its base within the Pashtun rural areas. So the, the base and the foundation of the Taliban is the Pashtun clans, uh, mainly uh, the Gilji clan, I think, and the rural areas in, within southern Afghanistan, especially, and the, the tribal people, who uh, some of them who are nomadic in their lifestyle, and this helped uh, in the proliferation of the Taliban around Afghanistan. While 
the Americans, after they invaded uh, Afghanistan, they uh, placed uh, their own government led by Karzai. And Karzai was the man for the American government. Karzai himself uh, being Durrani, born in Kandahar. He was a Durrani. And the Duranis traditionally were the most educated from the Afghan, Afghani people. So the, he, while the clans that the Taliban belonged to, in terms of Western education, are not as uh, westernized or as Western educated as the Durrani people. So Karzai represented a specific class of Afghani people. And remember, Afghanis are not limited to Pashtuns. They have numerous ethnic groups within Afghanistan. So the invasion of Afghanistan was simultaneous to the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Now, Iraq, the invasion of Iraq was much more brutal, even though the invasion of Afghanistan was brutal in the sense that there was bloodshed. I remember reports when they, the invasion, after the invasion, the Northern Alliance claimed to have killed over 10,000 Taliban fighters. And at the time, they were even removing gold teeth from the dead. So they would break and smash the teeth of the dead people to remove the gold from their teeth. There was, there was an incident and a report within mainstream media where a Northern Alliance soldier, Shumayli Ittihad soldier, claimed that he will kiss the Quran, place the Quran in his pocket and then shoot the uh, Taliban prisoner. So there was this type of brutal behavior at the time. Shumayli Ittihad carried out its revenge attacks against the Taliban movement and the Taliban were removed from power and everyone had thought at the time when Mullah Umar uh, fled, the way the leadership of uh, Kabul has fled recently, Mullah Umar left Kandahar on a motorbike with one more individual. Later, he passed away. They, some say he went to Kuwaita, and then others say he passed away in a Karachi hospital. Of course, there was collusion of ISI with Taliban leadership. So, as I stated, the Iraqi invasion was much more brutal. In Iraq, you had uh, the resistance fighters within Fallujah, for instance. War weapons that had never been used were used in Fallujah, and in Fallujah, chemicals were used and dropped upon the civilian population as well as the fighters in Fallujah. Fallujah fighters, people from Syria, boarded buses in 2003. I was in Syria at the time in early 2003, and I remember buses of Syrians left from Damascus to go to Iraq to fight jihad, crossing the border from Syria into Iraq. And these were all Sunni Muslims. They were entering Iraq to fight jihad. Even the students from Ma'adul Fath al-Islami, many of them went over. So the Ma'ad, Al-Fath al-Islami, many of the young students of knowledge, they went over into Iraq to fight jihad against the Americans and the, uh, the, uh, the allies, the American allies. And the air bombardment started in around March or April 2003. After which America carried out many brutal attacks against civilian populations in Iraq. We know prior to the 2003 invasion, Madeleine Albright was questioned, is uh, the sanctions, are the sanctions on Iraq worth the lives of half a million children? And she responded in the positive that it is worth the lives of over half a million children. Famous um, ignorant statement uh, uttered by Madeleine Albright at the time. Now, Iraq had suffered from the sanctions in in the 19, early 1990s also, even though the civilian population was the, the main uh, segment that suffered from those sanctions. Uh, Saddam Hussein and his uh, Bitana, his, the, the people around him, his group, they did not suffer from those uh, sanctions as much as the civilian population. And many children died of starvation and malnutrition. But then after the 2003 invasion, the number of orphans uh, went into the millions within uh, Iraq. 
So Iraq still suffers from the after effects of the 2003 invasion and the formation of groups like uh, Jabhat al-Nusra or the uh, ISIS, uh, is, uh, the so-called Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, which is known as Daesh. Some people, they say we refuse to call them ISIS, but Daesh is, uh, is still uh, the acronym for the same thing, Dawlatul Islam fil Iraqi wa Sham. So Daesh and ISIS mean the same thing. So these groups found breeding ground within Iraq. So the situation within Iraq, uh, all these events that we observe today, they have a connection down the timeline to disconnect as the uh, media does, disconnecting events is to escape our situation. So the current situation is, int uh, is intrinsically linked to the invasion of 2001. The invasion of 2001 is intrinsically linked to the, the formation of groups like Al-Qaeda from 1979 to 1989 and America's war against the Soviet Union. And of course, today America has left the way they left Vietnam. Now the Vietnam War was based upon America's war against communism. But then the war of 1979 to 1989 was based upon America's war against communism. But that led to the events of 2001 because America gave safe uh, breeding ground for groups like Al-Qaeda, which then attacked America on its own soil in 2001. Those attacks, 9-11 attacks in 2001, gave America a justification to invade Afghanistan in 2001. But also the invasion of Iraq in 2003, considering the fact that Saddam Hussein was totally disconnected with Al-Qaeda. So at the time, even popular writers like Michael Moore um, wrote a book like Stupid White Men, he even made a documentary, and the claim was made that America is simply invading Iraq for the oil, simply invading Iraq for the oil and for the natural resources. In both countries, in Afghanistan and in Iraq, governments were formed. So if you remember the Maliki government in Iraq, and then you had Hamid Karzai in Afghanistan, these were puppet governments. And America, as we know, spent at least over 150 billion in Afghanistan, over 80 billion just on the army. So this army that finished and disappeared, dissipated within a short period of time, over 80 billion was spent, uh, 80 billion American dollars on the training and equipping the Afghan army, the current Afghan army, as well as spending millions on Iraq, uh, billions on Iraq and the, uh, propping up a puppet government in Iraq. And now America has abandoned both countries. So with regard to the Taliban itself, uh, the people are asking as to whether the Taliban represents the black banners. This I will go on to into the third segment of my response with regard to uh, the Taliban. But with regard to the Taliban itself, firstly, we have to understand the formation of such groups within a post-war Afghanistan. And also Afghanistan prior to 1979 was a country still developing. They even established uh, water dams in Afghanistan at the time prior to 1979. Strangely enough, uh, the dams were f made by American companies. Those dams were later misused to grow poppies, even though the, uh, the government prior to the communist regime did not intend the dams to grow poppies. The dams were obviously formed for farming and cultivation and betterment of the country. After the 1979 invasion and Pakistan colluding with America and Saudi Arabia, within the northern areas, at that time known as the Northwest Frontier, uh, because Pakistan, even at that time, not even giving the, the state a, a name now it's known as Khaybar Pakhtun, but at the time it was just simply known as the Northwest Frontier Province. 
which is the, the colonial British name for that region, because the area is populated by Pashtun tribes and uh, the uh, northern tribes, the tribal people, as well as the city urban Pashtuns in Peshawar and other cities. But in this area of Northwest Frontier province, fighters, foreign fighters were brought in from Saudi Arabia, from Egypt, and some of them belonged to the Ikhwan al-Muslimin, some of them belonged to the al-Harqat al-Salafiyya, the Salafi movement, um, the likes of a Sheikh Abdullah Azzam, all these people, they entered in that region, they were trained, uh, and the CIA colluded with the ISI in training these people in order to fight the Soviet invasion and the Soviet aggressor. Whatever people's thoughts may be with regard to General Zia and his policies, and the training of such groups, uh, as well as enrolling the orphans that were coming in from Afghanistan into the Madaris, various Diobandi Madaris in that region in the Northwest frontier. You had the Haqqani Madrasa, which is well known, the Madrasa of uh, uh, Maulana Samuel Haq, who's passed away. His Madrasa had big enrollment of these students who became known as Taliban. And Taliban, many Arabs ask, how can, what does this word Taliban mean? Because in Arabic, Taliban, Talibani is two students. So they don't understand that in Farsi, when you make a plural, you add alif and noon. So Talib becomes Taliban. So Taliban is in fact a plural of students. So when the war finished, post-1989, you had these orphans as well uh, who were trained in Madaris, and you had these fighters who were trained by the ISI and the CIA who fought against the Soviets. But America, like it abandoned Afghanistan today, and Muslims should learn from this, that uh, the Western uh, high-tech North, the white man, the Anglosphere, will always invade a country for its own vested interests. Once its interests have been fulfilled, they will abandon you. This is irrelevant to which country. Muslims should never be trusting of the Western Anglo white man when he invades a country. Uh, this is a fact. And the, the Americans, they departed and abandoned Afghanistan, allowing all these militias to fight amongst themselves. Some of them carried out malicious uh, attacks, vile attacks against civilians and innocent people. And the Taliban was in fact a, an ISI funded project in order to uh, place some type of stability in Afghanistan. So the Taliban grew from the mid 90s and then it expanded. Later on in 1996, they uh, took over Kabul. And at the time they became notorious for the, the niqab of the women because they mix interpretation of Islamic law with Pashtun culture, which I will go into later. Later, So they obliged all the women to wear niqab and the men to grow their beards. The men had to grow their beards. But they had some good points where they placed law and order where crime, theft and these type of things went down. They say, for instance, regarding Kandahar, I remember reading in an English article, they said Kandahar prior to uh, the Taliban was known as the capital for homosexuality in Central Asia. And birds would fly with one wing, covering w the back region with another wing. And then after the Taliban were ruling, the birds would fly with two wings. So Allah knows best with regard to this. Only Afghani people would know whether this is true or not. But the Taliban formed in this time and then uh, the Haqqani Madaris were Diobandi Madaris, and this is why the Diobandis claim Taliban for themselves. And the unique interpretations of some of the Sharia has its roots in the Diobandi Madaris within the Northwest Frontier province, as it was known at that time, uh, Khaybar Pakhtun, as we know it today. So, up to the invasion, Taliban was governing Afghanistan. There was some form of stability. However, Shamaili Ittihad controlled 10% of the country. And then Shamaili Ittihad was incorporated into the Karzai government, which of course we know Western foreign policy is not uh, sincere, meaning Western foreign policy claims that 
it is emancipating the women of Afghanistan, emancipating and freeing the women, giving uh, rights. Where are the disagreements with Taliban? The interpretation of some of their Sharia is based actually in Pashtun culture or their tribal culture as opposed to Islam itself. For instance, not permitting women to work. This has no roots in Islamic um, law. In Islamic law, women are permitted to work, women are permitted to trade. In fact, Sayyiduna Umar an had a woman in charge of the marketplace. So when Sayyiduna Umar an was Khalifa, a woman was in charge of the marketplace in Al-Madinat al munawwara Additionally, in the Hanafi school, the burqa is not wajib in our Hanafi school. So now Taliban have declared Hanafi fiqh the official jurisprudence of Afghanistan. But in Hanafi fiqh, the burqa, the face veil, is not wajib. It is only wajib if there is a possibility or a near certainty of fitna of tribulation. Additionally, uh, beating people with wires uh, on the roads, if this is correctly as ascribed to Taliban, this is all incorrect according to Sharia law because there is a due process in Sharia law for any punishments to be carried out. In fact, uh, striking someone is known as ta'zir in Islamic law. Ta'zir is only the right of the ruler. And in our Hanafi school, the ruler only has 10 strikes. The ruler only has 10 maximum strikes. According to other schools, th th there are an increase of strikes, but even those strikes are limited to utilizing a stick, which is thin as the small finger, with no nettles, no sharp points, and as big as the forearm. And the person who strikes cannot lift his arm enough that a book will fall out from underneath his armpit. And even to carry out this strike, the ruler uh, will do it himself or he will, the due process of a qadi will take place. So a random fighter, a random soldier cannot go around beating uh, the public unless there's a, a law and order situation um, uh, with the sticks or with wires or whatever. Uh, weapons are used. In fact, the Sharia law is so merciful that in the time of Nuruddin Zangi, rahimahullah ta'ala, the, there was so much crime in the area of Halab in Aleppo that the governors advised Nuruddin Zangi do not only apply Sharia law, apply more harsh laws. And he inquired why, and they said, because the Sharia law is not sufficient to stop crime. So Nuruddin Zangi rahimullah ta'ala wrote to Umar al-Malla, a Sheikh Umar al-Malla in the city of Hims, and he said the same. But then Nuruddin Zangi went against this and he only applied Sharia law. And because of only applying the Sharia law, the crime decreased. But why did they say to him, do not only apply the Sharia law? Because they said it's not harsh enough. In fact, there is a, a due process. Additionally, the Hudud punishments the corporal punishments are only applied during times of peace and cannot apply during civil war. During civil war, there is no corporal punishments. So the, the hadith states, لا تقطع الأيدي في الغزو During battles, during war, the hands are not cut off. Why? Because the, in order for the, the, the hadith to be established, there must be civil order. Also, if there is poverty, many of the laws are not applicable. So if the women are not allowed to work and they are not receiving uh, sufficient wealth from the government and they are found stealing, how can the Sharia law apply on them? The Sharia law is not, the had is not applied upon them. So the obligation of the ruler is to collect the zakat and distribute the zakat amongst the poor. He must collect the kharaj, he must collect the ushr. These are all the various Islamic taxes, the sadaqatul fitr, and then within one year distribute them fairly amongst the people. So these are a few critical points that must be reviewed when uh, discussing the Taliban. However, 
I would not equate Taliban with ISIS because Taliban is still a native uh, development, meaning within Afghanistan, unlike ISIS. ISIS was an actual foreign aggression. Foreign fighters entered Iraq and Syria, mainly from Saudi Arabia. Many of the fighters at the top were Saudi Arabians. There was Iraqis right at the top, but main, many fighters were Saudis. And many of the people from Morocco and the Western African uh, fr from West Africa, meaning Morocco and Algeria. Many of these people entered Syria to form what they call Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. And they had more of a Salafi interpretation of Sharia law. So what happened in 2014 is that Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi entered the uh, city of Mosul and invaded the city of Mosul and declared himself as Khalifa. And this shocked many of the, uh, the Muslims, including Western Muslims, Muslims who reside within the UK. Similarly, I would like to say that now that uh, Taliban have taken over Kabul, a similar shock has occurred amongst Western Muslims. That Western Muslims uh, are confused with regard to how to understand the Taliban takeover of Kabul. Does it entail an Islamic state? Does it entail a caliphate? Does it entail uh, something greater than what we see? And I would like to give my thoughts on this. Firstly, uh, the people who became mesmerized by Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi in 2014 unfortunately included many of the young people who thought that an Islamic caliphate has been re-established in Iraq and Syria and some of them through their misguidance left the UK and joined the ISIS cult, the ISIS apocalyptic cult and today we know seven years later that many of them were killed and they even left young children abandoned in Syria that are now left in refugee camps. So those young children are in refugee camps and many of them are stateless. They have no state to live in. This is all due to an enthusiasm to live in an Islamic state as they conceive it or dreams with regard to the Islamic caliphate. The same mistake cannot be made again. That even though Taliban has taken over Kabul, Afghanistan is for the Afghanis. That a British person should not attempt to relocate in Afghanistan. Or anyone else from anywhere in the world should not attempt to relocate in Afghanistan. It is in fact dangerous. And we should learn from our, the mistakes of the past where people became beguiled into thinking that an Islamic caliphate is being formed and that caliphate, in fact, will take on America and uh, the Western world. So what position should we take towards Afghanistan and the Taliban? Firstly, Afghanistan falls under Islamic terms, we would say an emirate. An, an emirate is that it is governed by an emir. The emir is whoever they select. But it does not fall under a caliphate. For a caliphate, the leader must be Qurayshi. The leader of the Taliban is not a Qurayshi. This is one of the conditions mentioned even in the book studied by the Taliban, which is Sharh al-Aqaid of Imam Sa'aduddin al-Taftazani, rahimahullah ta'ala, that the uh, Khalifa should be Qurayshi. Now, some people say the Uthmani, the Ottomans, were not Qurayshi. This, in fact, is misinformation Many of the people are misinformed with regard to this. A Sheikh Abdul Ghani and Nablusi rahimallahu ta'ala wrote an entire work establishing the roots of the Ottomans within the Quraysh. So you can refer back to that work that Al Imam uh, Abdul Ghani and Nablusi rahimallahu ta'ala deemed them as being Qurayshi. But with regard to the Taliban, they are in fact Pashtun, they are not Qurayshi. So therefore, the Emirate of Afghanistan cannot be termed as being a caliphate. The other tasks of the caliphate is to secure the borders. 
Afghanistan currently does not have full security. There must be full security. This is one of the conditions of the caliphate. The wealth must be distributed, meaning the Khalifa collects the zakat and distributes the zakat and collects the kharaj, which is the farming tax. The, the farms and the cultivation must be taxed and redistributed amongst the poor. So Taliban cannot be involved in opium dealing, for instance. They must collect the wheat and barley and distribute wheat and barley amongst the poor. There are other conditions for the hudud, the corporal punishments to apply this. The country must be in total peace for good courts to be established. Additionally, some of the interpretations of Sharia law are incorrect within the old Taliban at least, which included not permitting women to work. And I am not saying this as an apologist for the feminist movements. The feminists and the Western groups have their own agenda. With regard to Islam, there is no prohibition of women leaving the house within the confines of their own city. There is no prohibition of women driving. There is no prohibition of women carrying out their daily work. With, uh, the only prohibition that there is is traveling out of the city uh, without a mahram, but that is not enforced by a government. That is an oblig individual ob obligation on the woman to comply with between her and Allah. It is not necessary for the government to interfere in, with this regard. So there are certain things that need to be revised within the Taliban, that they need to revise certain interpretations relating to the hukuk al mar'a, which are rights of women, or interpretations of how they apply hudud or economic policies, as well as the other tribal issues within Afghanistan, which Afghani viewers will understand better than myself. But for the broader Muslims, and especially those, for instance, people in Pakistan who are pro-Taliban, I would like to say, if you are pro-Taliban in Afghanistan, then you should have a Taliban in Pakistan also. Why do I say this? Because in Pakistan, you have lawlessness, crimes of a despicable, a despicable nature occurring in Pakistan. That if you want to impose a Taliban government in Afghanistan upon the Afghani people, then you should be happy for the corporal punishments to be established in Pakistan. Nevertheless, I would say that the Taliban rule is beneficial for Pakistan. Why? Because it does protect aggression from the northern border in terms of India and its raw agents that enter from Afghanistan and Indian or India vested interests within that region. So Afghanistan is more pro-Pakistan, uh, the Taliban government is more pro-Pakistan than the Karzai government. In this sense, Pakistan benefits, as well as Kashmir. Kashmir benefits also with the Taliban government in Afghanistan. But for those people who prefer Taliban for religious reasons in Afghanistan, they should uh, also call for such governments within their own countries. Because look, there are people living here in England who support the Taliban, but yet here in England, they enjoy the freedoms that their women and women folk have in terms of the women of our households are able to drive around, which is permitted in Sharia. There is no prohibition. Saudi Arabia also had this wrong interpretation of women not being permitted to drive, a Najdi Bedouin interpretation of Sharia law. There is no prohibition on women driving. Where did they? It is not found in the Quran and it is not found in the Sunnah. It is a tribal interpretation. But now Saudi Arabia has abolished that law. Likewise, Taliban has some uh, policies which people who are happy that there is a Taliban government in Afghanistan, here they enjoy their freedoms that they have. And our women folk are able to drive, are able to walk around in the city freely, which is permitted for women to walk around on the roads of within their own city. This is not prohibited in Sharia. But they enjoy these freedoms, yet they are happy for the people of uh, Afghanistan to live under the Taliban rule. But that is not to say that Hamid Karzai was a, and his government was any good. Because in fact, uh, Dostum and other characters, as I mentioned in the beginning, unsavory characters, were not people who gave 
human rights to all the people of Afghanistan. They are in fact war criminals. And America was hypocritical in its alliance with those war criminals also. So the final statement with regard to Taliban for us as general Muslims is to wait and see how their policies play out. Additionally, I would advise younger Muslims not to fall into a fantasy or a fantasy world of a new caliphate being propped up as they did some of them in 2014 with ISIS when ISIS appeared some people over 900 people left the UK to join ISIS their minds were corrupted they became misguided and the outcome is what we saw that many of them died and they were uh, they have no homes and some of them have become stateless likewise do not be misguided into thinking that because Taliban has taken over Kabul now an Islamic State has been established no Afghanistan is dealing with its own internal problems Afghanistan is for Afghanis people who are born within Afghanistan who live within that environment they are able to live in that country and they are able to deal with the internal Con tribal conflicts between the Farsi speakers, the Pashto speakers, they have their own issues, but foreign people should not in attempt to migrate towards Afghanistan. In fact, this would be a major mistake for them to do so. I would also like to state that some people, they feel guilty. There are some Muslims within the UK and other places, they feel guilty for living here within the UK. Because they see the suffering in Afghanistan, they see the suffering in Kashmir, they see the suffering in Palestine, they see the suffering, and they feel implicitly uh, responsible for the suffering that occurs all the way in the East. So some of them then want to join such groups and be recruited into such groups or migrate to those lands. So what is the legal ruling uh, with regard to these things. Firstly, it's not an obligation to migrate in the current world situation. Because even if you migrate to Makkah al mukarramah I'm saying it's not an obligation. Even if you migrate to Makkah al mukarramah the ruler, Muhammad bin Salman, his father is Salman, but uh, is the ruler, but Muhammad bin Salman, the prince, has more authority than many of the governors and princes within that country. Many of his policies are un-Islamic and people are being imprisoned for their Islam even within Saudi Arabia, what is known as Saudi Arabia. The only country named after a family. Even the original name of Saudi Arabia is Arabia, not Saudi Arabia. And within Afghanistan, people still face imprisonment. There are many war crimes and human rights abuses that occur. You, if you migrate to Syria, whether it's Idlib, which is controlled by the rebels, or whether you migrate to Damascus, which is ruled by Bashar al-Assad, you are endangering yourself. Where, even if you move to stable Pakistan, a British person, many British people will find it very difficult to settle in a country like Pakistan also. But having said this, people should not feel this guilt that the suffering that is occurring in the East, they are responsible for implicitly. Hijrah is not an obligation unless your religion is endangered in the sense that you cannot perform the Salah, you cannot carry out the Sha'airul Islam, the hallmarks of the religion, the headscarf is banned, the recitation of the Quran is banned, then you migrate. But in Britain today, we do not have any of that. In fact, we have freedom to practice our religion, and we should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we have this and we should not become like the Yahud, the Jews when they migrate, when they roamed uh, in the desert, they were given food, they were given the best food, al mannu wa salwa, they were given honey and partridge, good food, and they still wanted uh, cucumber and lentils and onions. Here we have freedom to practice all our religion, we say so many things, we are not arrested. So now, I'm delivering a lecture with freedom to say 
what Islam states with regard to our current situation, and we do not face any interrogation or any discrimination for freedom of speech. But so many of these uh, nation states, so many of these nation states, they are controlled by dictators. That if you say something, you are arrested. Even if you practice your religion in some of these parts of what we call the Muslim world, what we name the Muslim world, people are arrested for their opinions or for their statements. So do not wish for people uh, a regime or a totalitarianism that you will not wish for yourself, that you cannot uh, live under yourself. So with Taliban, we would say, legally speaking, it's an emirate, uh, legally Islamically, it's an emirate governed by a group known as Taliban who claim that they will govern the country with Hanafi fiqh, time will unfold the reality of this group. Time will tell the reality of this group, whether they will administer the country with justice, spreading justice amongst all the tribes and the warring factions, and whether they will apply Islamic law correctly, and time will unfold the reality as to whether they are true to their Islam. But for us as Muslims, meaning across the globe, and especially as British Muslims, are we obliged to migrate there? The answer is no. In fact, you are endangering, endangering yourself, placing yourself in danger and your families in danger. Lastly, the most common question which people have asked is with regard to the black banners. They have said, is Taliban the group of the black banners? Now I will give the answer that I have given and I gave when ISIS came about. At that time, many people were traumatized. They were confused. They didn't know where to place ISIS in terms of its position in the Akhir zaman and in eschatology. The simple answer is that the group that shall be the group of the black banners will only be the group that will place those black flags in Jerusalem. The Hadith states that the Raya to Sud, the black flags, they will appear in Khurasan. Khurasan is in Afghanistan and Iran. In eastern Iran and western Afghanistan, you have the region of Khurasan. From that region, a small group will appear. The Taliban fighters number over 200,000 according to uh, latest statistics, but a small group will appear from Khurasan and the hadith states la yarudduhum shay'un nothing will be able to dive, to stop them and they will reach hatta tunsaba bi'iliya that they will carry on marching from Khurasan until the flags will be placed in Ilya, Ilya is Jerusalem, one of the many names for Jerusalem. Jerusalem has over 17 names. So the flags will be placed in Ilya. That is the group of the black banners. The question is, is Taliban that group? Now, if firstly, Taliban do not claim to be that group. ISIS did claim to be that group. Uh, secondly, Taliban's flag is white. But if Taliban is that group, then time will unfold that reality and they will place the flags in Ilya. Personally, I do not think Taliban are that group, but the group will definitely appear from that region, from Khurasan. Secondly, the group cannot appear until the river Euphrates uncovers a mountain of gold, and that sign has not happened. So we are living in Al-Fitnatul Rabi'ah, the fourth tribulation. The next sign is the Euphrates River gold. Between this time, the caliphate, will not be established until Al Imam al Mahdi. But then people ask, why do you talk about caliphate? Why do you talk about the obligation of reestablishing the caliphate? The response is twofold. One is to prepare the people for the time of Al Imam al Mahdi so they have the correct knowledge of the caliphate. Secondly, it protects the people from misguided claimants of the caliphate and also inculcating people with the knowledge of how the caliphate should be. So they are not misguided by groups like ISIS. 
So with regard to the black banners, no one can claim that the group of the black banners has appeared from this fitna, al-fitna to rabia which is the fitna which we live in, the, the period of time we live in is the fourth tribulation. Up to the fifth tribulation, which is the period of time when the Euphrates gold will be uncovered, the black banners group will be unknown. So where, where does the Taliban government fall into this? They fall into an emirate, like Pakistan. Pakistan is more secular than Taliban, but Pakistan still has some Islam in its constitution. It has the name Islamic Republic. But I would want to clarify something. In my previous lecture, I said Republican Islamic is a contradiction. So some Pakistanis, they said that uh, Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq was re selected by the people. Therefore, that was a republic. The response is, this is incorrect. Uh, firstly, Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq and all the caliphs were selected either by a previous caliph one person, or by a majlis shura, which is Ahlul Halli wal Aqt, which is not representative of all the public. It's a group of people known as Ahlul Halli wal Aqt. So what the founders of Pakistan said, they said the modern parliamentary system is a replacement for majlis shura or Ahlul Halli wal Aqt. Whether this is true or not, I will respond to another time. But the point is that the term republic does not fit in with Islamic because a caliphate is selected by a group of people known as Ahlul Halli wal Aqt, like an army general, uh, the chief justice. These people will be counted as Ahlul Halli wal Aqt. They select a ruler. Or the previous leader selects a leader. But you do not have democratic Western style elections through a ballot box and you select a caliph and you do not change the caliph every five years that you have re-elections every five years. So Pakistan, again, uh, I would like to make it clear as well to people that I am not anti-Pakistan in any way. Uh, Pakistan is better than many of the Muslim countries. Pakistan has more potential than many of the Muslim countries. And much of the Pakistani public is very sincere to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reason why I always critique Pakistan is because I see betterment, a uh, place for improve, uh, room for improvement, and give my suggestions with regard to this. Uh, the ISI is, should protect the borders of Pakistan from foreign aggression, especially Moody and his raw agents that attempt to destabilize Pakistan. And I do not agree with any destabilizing of any Muslim country, especially Pakistan. So destabilizing even of these nation states, secular nation states, they should not be destabilized by foreign aggressors like India or Israel or China. China, China doesn't seem to meddle within Muslim countries, but uh, we have the Uyghur uh, situation. But meddling within Muslim countries is something that Muslims should not fall prey to. And this is what scholars who warned about in revolutions against uh, governments, they warned with regard to in, uh, destabilizing Muslim countries internally. So the crit criticism I always mention is for betterment. And I am always open for counter criticism in order to improve uh, my uh, comments with regard to countries like Pakistan. So in conclusion, I would say that we should not uh, rush to any judgment. People should not be misguided into thinking they should migrate. They should not make that mistake. They should not deem this the return of the caliphate because it is not return of a caliphate. But at the same time, uh, the Taliban has opened up for criticism. They have improved some of their policies. But Muslims should continue, Muslim leaders should continue some sort of dialogue with the Taliban. Um, and the Taliban should open up with dialogue with Muslim rulers also. Inshallah, we will open up for questions and answers. Uh, the questions, please place your questions within the uh, comment section. And I will read out your questions and then answer accordingly.
So uh, one brother has asked to defeat two superpowers with very little is something in itself, of course, requires faith and yes, of course, but we must not forget that firstly, the Afghani people were supported by Pakistan and was supported by the CIA from 79 to 89. One million Afghanis died in that war, and that's not a small number. And for Taliban to have defeated America now, it took 20 years. And remember the Vietnam War, the, the Viet Cong also defeated America. So if someone is saying their defeat of America is in fact uh, alluding to divine support or alluding to them being the group of the black banners, this is incorrect. But at the same time, America being kicked out, uh, the uh, imperial powers that governed that region or not governed, uh, invaded that region being kicked out is uh, an immense uh, achievement by Taliban and those who fought them. The famous Syrian scholar said, the awam should not rebel against the government. Do you agree, Sheikh? Yes, I do agree with that. A question, who do you think the real target was? As the Taliban removed very early on, despite this, the USA remained for 20 years. Do you think that Pakistan was a target as a nuclear um, a Muslim state which has a strategic location and also suffered much from the war on terror. Of course, even though I disagree with Pervez Musharraf and his policies, uh, Pakistan has always been a thorn in the side of India and America and Israel. So, of course, there is, um, there is a ploy to remove Pakistan, to finish off Pakistan as it stands today. And Muslims should never be conducive to anti-Pakistani sentiment that destabilizes Pakistan. So criticism of Pakistan does not entail uh, destabilizing the country or any other Muslim country. And I would say this with regard to majority of Muslim countries. Look how critical we are of Saudi Arabia. But at the same time, we would never call for civil war within Saudi Arabia. Someone asked, how long does tribulation periods last on average? Uh, the correct response is that we do not know, that the tribulation periods can last for decades. So this tribulation period will last until the uncovering of the depository of gold. Are Taliban Sunni or Diobandi? Firstly, the Haqqani uh, segment within the Taliban is Diobandi. The, the Haqqani group has big influence within the Taliban. Taliban have released a, an Arabic statement with six points. Six points. And within those six points, they banned Salafism. Salafism in, is banned in Afghanistan. Wahhabism is banned. Someone mentioned to me that they banned the Mawlid. But I have not found any proof for this. There is no proof for this, as far as I know. But they have banned exaggerated practices at the shrines. Is this a good thing? The answer is yes, because the sajda at the shrines should be prohibited. The circumambulation around the shrines should be prohibited. And exaggeration should be prohibited. But I have not found in that six-point statement anything to suggest that they are not Ahl Sunnah in that statement. But the Haqqani group is the Omandi. So the Afghanis within Afghanistan traditionally are traditional Hanafi Maturidis and they have Turuq, they have Sufi orders also, Naqshbandi and others. But if you mean, are they Sunni in the sense that some of our Punjabi and Indian people want them to have their particular type of Sunni brand, meaning, for instance, wearing orange or uh, doing 
uh, qawali or these type of things, that is not necessarily a Sunni thing. Or if uh, people mean, uh, do they have their own uh, similar type of Sunni practices as they do in certain parts of India or certain parts of Pakistan, th that's incorrect. They are Afghani, so, but they claim to be Hanafi Maturidi. And they have banned also the Panjbir group, which is, as I am told, is the group that is the Mamati Diobandis. They have banned them. Do you think that TLP could follow same format as Taliban in Pakistan? The answer is no. Because the, the TLP, Tahrik al Labbaik, firstly, they went through the democratic system. And through democratic system, you cannot have a government like Taliban because majority of the Pakistanis do not want a government like uh, Taliban. Even though some of them would wish it for their neighbors in Afghanistan, they would not vote for a government uh, like Taliban. The only way Pakistan can have Sharia law is if the uh, leaders are guided in some way in understanding that they need to apply al-hudud, the corporal punishments, the is Islamic economic laws, as well as uh, Islamic foreign policy and all the other trappings. What is the difference between Pakistani and Afghani Taliban? The Afghani Taliban is supported by Pakistan and ISI, while the, what is referred to as the Pakistani Taliban, tahrik -e taliban is in fact an aggressor towards Pakistan and has no link with the Afghani Taliban. They are two uh, distinct entities, mutually exclusive entities. Someone wrote here, that sometimes you, so this questioner, someone said, Salam Sheikh, based on religious text, is it possible to give an approximation of how many years the blessed period of Imam al-Mahdi is far away from 2021? I would respond to this by saying never go into the game of predictions. Never attempt to give exact years. The Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ has given us signposts. So we know what signpost we wait at. The next signpost is the Euphrates River. When that occurs, we will know how many years th there are between the two signposts. Anyone who reads the Ahadith and the Ashratu Sa'a knows their correct order they will know that we follow the signpost. And anyone who gives you exact dates, they always turn out to be wrong. So do never fall into uh, giving dates. What role will Pakistan play at the end of times? And is the Pakistani army? The response is that uh, the Pakistani army has not been mentioned in any hadith. So the world, when Imam al-Mahdi radiallahu anhu appears, uh, the Khurasan, the army from Khurasan is mentioned. And this group is mentioned as being formed so quickly that they will be formed like the cloud on a winter's day, meaning very quickly. So the group does not exist currently. They will exist after, after the Euphrates gold sign. And then they will march from Khurasan to Jerusalem and conquer Jerusalem. 
as for Ghazwatul Hind, Ghazwatul Hind will occur after this, when Al Imam Al Mahdi radiallahu an will deploy troops to India, and when they are deployed, they will invade India. So, uh, what role the Pakistani army has in this uh, is not mentioned in any of the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. There are many questions coming in, so the questions are moving quick. Thoughts on a united Pakistan Afghan Emirate. Um, the response is this would have to happen by willingness on the part of Afghani leadership and Pakistani leadership as well as the public. But there are many Afghanis who despise Pakistan for many reasons, and there are many Pakistanis who despise Afghanis. And the only thing that can unite everyone is Islam. When Al Imam Al Mahdi radiallahu anhu re establishes the caliphate, should Muslims from Europe move back to the clans of the caliphate? When Al Imam Al Mahdi radiallahu anhu appears, Muslims must follow the dictates of Al Imam Al Mahdi. So he will give the fatwa, he will be a mujtahid, and he will give the correct fatwa for the people to follow. Someone asked, can we do Isal al thawab for Ahlul Bayt, the blessed martyrdom of Karbala by keeping fast? Yes, this is permitted. Someone asked, is Al Imam Al Mahdi radiallahu anhu alive now? This is ghayb, this is unseen knowledge. Secondly, Al Imam Al Mahdi radiallahu anhu will not appear until the Euphrates gold appears, until an army from Syria is swallowed in an area known as Al Bayda outside of Al Madina Al Munawwara, until an earthquake occurs in the city of Harasta. <coughs> the epicenter will be the city of Harasta from which the western wall of the Grand Umayyad Mosque will collapse. All of these signs have not occurred. So Al-Imam Al-Mahdi will not be appearing anytime soon unless these signs occur. Sheikh, don't you think it's, it is suspect how quickly Afghanistan fell to the Taliban? Is this pre-planned by the West or an experiment for a future invasion? 
Uh, firstly, uh, the war has been continuing for 20 years. So a 20, sustaining a 20-year war and spending over 150 billion on the so-called Afghani government, the puppet government, is not sustainable even for the Americans. So uh, the Americans abandoning Afghanistan is typical when you look at American foreign policy. This is a very typical thing to do. And uh, the Taliban taking over mass land is a possibility because of the, the bedrock of the Taliban is the Pashtun, uh, the rural Pashtuns. And the rural Pashtuns are sp spread out throughout Afghanistan. And this is the first time of, uh, Taliban have incorporated all the tribes. This is the first time. Previously, they were mainly Pashtun. But now they have incorporated all the various types of Af Afghanis. Someone asked, Taliban rebelled against ruler. Isn't it prohibited? Uh, the, the ruler was, in fact, America. So um, the thing is that Hamid Karzai and his government were not actual legitimate rulers because they were propped up by a foreign aggressor. What's your opinion on the Naqshbandi Khalidi movement in Turkey, uh, Mahmoud Afendi? As far as I know, Sheikh Mahmoud Afendi is from the great awliya of our time. Someone asked, should we believe in Taliban? The answer is, Ayyuhal Ikhwa, do not believe in any group. Do not believe in these groups. Just look at the Islamic ruling and what they do. So young people should not be joining groups. I do not advocate for young people to join groups. The only Ahl uh, Sunnati wal Jama'ah is the people of the four madhabs the Asha'ira and the Maturidis, and we look at the Islamic ruling of what the groups do. So whether it's Ikhwan al-Muslimin or any other group, we judge them in accordance with the Qur'an, the Sunnah, and the fiqh rulings of the four madhahib. Do not join any group because you do not know what the leadership does. But there is a Ta'ifatul Mansura. And a Ta'ifatul Mansura are the actual resistance fighters in Palestine those who fight the aggression. But at the same time, they do not need foreigners to go and join them because they have fighters. Would currency with intrinsic value start again in Afghanistan? This, of course, depends on the, Afghani, the Taliban leadership. Are they astute enough to implement, are they able to implement intrinsic valued uh, currency, which Pakistan, in fact, should lead the way by in, uh, reinstating the Chandi rupee? Could you kindly explain in these times, how should a Muslim behave? Is it better to stay quiet on politics? And how should uh, one invite people to good amal in these times when people are re really, when people are really tough? Uh, the political Muslims are those who are part of a group. The apolitical Muslim is the one who judges events in accordance with the Quran, Sunnah, and the four madhabs. So the ulama should speak on political events, but enlightening people with regard to political events in accordance with the Qur'an, the Sunnah, and the Ahkam, the legal rulings within the four schools. Someone asks, 
what are the signs of Ghazwa Tul Hind? Uh, firstly, the Ghazwa Tul Hind will only occur after Al Imam Al Mahdi radiallahu anhu appears. Thoughts on Taliban meeting Hamas. Uh, uh, Taliban should assist the Palestinian resistance. Pakistan should assist the, Pakistan, uh, the Palestinian resistance. Turkey must assist the Palestinian resistance. Every Muslim nation must support and assist the Palestinian resistance, which is the main focal point of resistance in the world today for the Muslims. Will you be trying to arrange a meeting with Sheikh Imran Hussein on certain topics you disagreed on? Sheikh Imran Hussein has refused to meet me in Trinidad, avoided me, even though I found, found him via his close friends, he refused to meet, and which was shameful because he says the ulama, they are, un, they are unwilling to sit and discuss, and then he avoided me in Birmingham also. The Salafis claim the Khurasan hadith is fabricated and weak. Is this true? The response is no. The hadith is in Tirmidhi. Al Imam al Tirmidhi says the hadith is gharib, but the hadith is not weak. You can check the chain. It's also in the Sunan of Ibn Majah, and it's found in other works of hadith. It's not a fabricated, a weak hadith. Why is there conflict between Taliban and ISIS? The response is they are not uh, the same. Taliban is homegrown uh, within Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, the people are native to the land. They are Pashtun, they have the same culture. ISIS is a foreign entity that entered Syria and Iraq. ISIS is Salafi, but not only Salafi, meaning pseudo-Salafi, but not even similar to the Saudi Salafis. Uh, they are Salafis on steroids. They are beyond uh, standard Salafism. Or they are similar to the movement of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab. Taliban on the other hand are Hanafis. So they have a fiqh, a jurisprudence. They can refer back to the jurisprudence. Uh, the Taliban also have a, an entrenched history within Afghanistan. Is the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 1500 years? The person is referring to the research of Imam Jalaluddin Al-Suyuti Rahimahullah Ta'ala which states that the Ummah will not go beyond 1500 years. Uh, with regard to this, I will say Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala knows best. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala knows best. But seeing the state of the world and where the world is heading, we know that time is limited. Just read upon uh, the climate, the biosphere, and the current state of the natural environment. So the world is in imbalance, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best how long humanity will survive. A brother asks, I just read the peace treaty, State Department. Of Afghan Islamic Emirate, and it is very strange and unexpected. Please help brother, as I trust Taliban. 
Uh, remember, you never know what the leadership of any group does behind the scenes. So as Muslims, we judge events in accordance with the Quran, Sunnah and the Ahkam, the legal status of anything. Do not align yourself with one group or one leader at this day and in this day and age. It's a dangerous age. Uh, you cannot place your trust in any one individual. Follow the Quran, the Sunnah and the Ahkam according to the four Sunni schools. So Taliban as an entity is not ma'asum, free from sin, free from mistakes. A person should not blindly trust Taliban or any other group. And this applies to all the groups across the board. Uh, by groups, I mean organizations. There are some sayings from Al-Imam Al-Qurtubi that Al-Imam Al-Mahdi will emerge from the West, in fact, from the furthest West, fil aqsa Al-Maghrib. Could this be true? The answer is no, um, because Al-Maghrib also refers to Ahlu Sham. And Al-Maghrib Al-Aqsa is also a name for Al-Sham. Some say because they would drink from uh, a container known as Gharb. So they're known as Ahlu Al-Maghrib. This has been covered by ulama in the books of Ashratu Sa'a. So Al-Imam Al-Mahdi radiallahu an will not appear from Morocco, without doubt. He will, he will be from Ahlul Hijaz, from the people of Al-Madinatul Munawwara. Is Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam a Sahabi as he saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on Laylatul Mi'raj? The answer is yes. He is a Nabi and a Sahabi. Is there any role of Turkey and Al Imam al Mahdi Caliphate? Uh, the response is Al Imam al Mahdi radiallahu anh, will in fact conquer Turkey. So we know in the seventh year of his rule he will conquer Constantinople. For him to conquer Constantinople entails that Turkey will be governed by something that is in contravention, in co contravening. Uh, Al-Imam Mahdi radiallahu an. So I believe the Erdogan government has a limited role and in the future, in the near future, the secularists will uh, regain control of Turkey. Is the Taliban group a sign of the last day? Uh, groups like Taliban have appeared in the past. If you read Islamic history, groups of rebels from time to time uh, conquered various regions or conquered small parts of the Muslim world and governed in accordance with Sharia law. But they were never deemed as the caliphate. So Taliban is one of those many movements. What will be the next sign happening before us? The next major sign is the drying of the Euphrates and the appearance of Euphrates gold. This is the one which will be a signpost. But prior to that, there will be Muslims or Muslims by name who will legalize homosexual marriage. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send down his punishment on them. The hadith mentions they will be punished by al-reh al-hamra, the red wing, the red wind. Al-Khasfu wal maskh Al-Khasfu is landslides and al maskh disfigurement. This sign will occur in the near future. There, there are many other signs like this that are yet to occur, but the major signpost is the drying of the Euphrates River. And with the imbalance of the biosphere, the world, the environment, the natural elements, we can see that that will occur very soon. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best whether it's within a decade Within two decades, within five decades, only Allah knows best. Will Europe become Islamic during the reign of Al Imam al Mahdi? The answer is that Al Imam al Mahdi will fight the European alliance and he will invade Rome. Rome, the Vatican, will be invaded by Imam al-Mahdi. 
So many people, they mention, and this is something that should be noted, they say, because Constantinople has already been conquered, the second conquering of Constantinople by Imam al-Mahdi, some of the ulama are of the position that is in fa- that hadith is in fact in a reference to the Vatican, while others take the position that he shall conquer Constantinople and the Vatican. Others say that he shall conquer the Vatican alone because the because Constantinople is already uh, under Muslim rule. If, however, we take the position that he shall conquer both, then it means that Constantinople shall again go under Ataturk rule, meaning <coughs> secular rule. <coughs> what will become of Africa and America in the time of Imam al-Mahdi? Africa will remain silent. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned in a hadith that Africa is never an aggressor. And leave the Habash, the African people, as long as they leave you. This is because the African people are a peaceful nation, I mean the whole of the African continent. They, this was told by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. With the exception of Dhu Aswaiqatayn, who shall appear after the time of Isa alayhi salam. But Muslims will not, will no longer exist on earth when he appears. As for America, it is mentioned in a hadith as a place known as Al-Qati'. Why is it known as Al-Qati'? This is mentioned by Imam Muhammad bin Abdi Rasul al-Barzanji. Al-Qati' is a place that is cut off from the mainland. And it has 500 entry points. Some say that this can refer to America. And Imam al-Mahdi will wage war against Al-Qati. Now, if Al-Qati is America, then America will finish. America is on its way to finishing as a superpower as we speak. Will Taliban fight India for Kashmir? Uh, again, if the, the Taliban government needs to ad- administer its own country and maintain peace within its own country, it's the responsibility of the Pakistani army to retake Kashmir. Liberal Muslims are parroting similar narratives to Western media. Some diaspora are also echoing similar thoughts. What would your message to them be? Uh, firstly, with regard to, there are facts and then there is uh, propag- uh, propaganda. Uh, some of the facts relating to Taliban's in- misinterpretations of certain segments of Sharia law, I have already mentioned. As far as propaganda is concerned, then the likes of Ivan Ridley are more qualified to comment with regard to propaganda as she is a former journalist and was a prisoner of the Taliban. So she's the most qualified person to comment on this. You mentioned the Maturidi and Asharis as a part of Ahl Sunnah. What about the Atharis? The Atharis are a part of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Where did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam warn about the Turks? That hadith is not about the current Turks. The current Turks are Muslims. That hadith is being misinterpreted by Saudi nationalists. That hadith is warning about the Mongol Turks, those who invaded Baghdad and Basra and Kufa. So the Arab nationalists are misquoting hadith that warn about Turks 
that is not in reference to modern Turkey or the Ottomans. It refers to the Mongol non-Muslim Turks. The time we are living in is Al-Fitna to Duhayma. Please tell us about that because many people are confused. <coughs> Al-Duhayma refers to the dark fitna, which is a tribulation on the hearts. It also involves <coughs> mindless killing. So Al-Duhayma, the current period that we live in, refers to the, the Muslims being confused with regard to their religion, that they wake up as Muslims and in the evening they are disbelievers because they sell their religion. <coughs> so during this period of tribulation, it's imperative for us as Muslims to safeguard our Iman and not to sell our religion. I heard there was a hadith about an alliance between the Muslims and the Christians to fight a common enemy nearing the end of times. Is this true? Yes, this is true. Initially, there will be an alliance between the Christians and Al-Imam Al-Mahdi. The alliance will be broken, after which Al-Imam Al-Mahdi will wage war against them. What is the Quburiya? The Quburiya is a name given to people who worship graves. So the Salafis, they apply this label upon anyone who visits a shrine. But the prohibited acts are prostrating to graves, circumambulation of graves, believing that the dead is able to help you other than Allah or without the will and might of Allah. This is shirk. So they, they, those people are referred to as Quburiya, but the Salafi movement applied the term Quburiya and every Muslim who visits a grave or believes in the permissibility of Tawassul. What is your view of offensive jihad in our times? The offensive jihad is waged by the Khalifa or the ruler. The Amir has the, the sanctioning power, the power to sanction offensive jihad. Offensive jihad, which I refer to as preemptive jihad, is agreed upon by ijma, by consensus. So what will the Afghanistan drama benefit Israel? They tend to strike when the world is distracted like the po poisonous snakes they are. Well, recently they entered the West Bank killing five Palestinians. So that was not on the headlines because of the events in Afghanistan. Five Palestinians were killed by an Israeli uh, or a terrorist incursion into the West Bank, killing five people. They claimed that they went to arrest uh, people from Hamas. And yes, while the world is distracted, Israel will continue its plots. Did the Taliban leader meet Allama Khadim Rizwi? Yes, this is claimed by the TLP movement that uh, Allama Khadim Rizwi, rahimahullah, visited Mullah Muhammad Umar. What's your opinion on the Kingdom of Morocco seen as they have signed a peace deal with Israel? Traditionally, Morocco has been with the good. In fact, uh, Al-Malik Al-Hassan, the father of the current King Al-Malik Muhammad, was the one who recorded the Arab meeting of the Arab nations like Egypt and Syria. He recorded the meeting and gave the recording to Mossad. So Israeli intelligence knew what the Arabs were planning prior to them carrying out their plans because of the father of the current king of Morocco. So Morocco has a history uh, in aligning itself with Mossad and the occupation in Palestine. 
as well as the ancestors of the current king were known to torture ulama like a Sayyid Muhammad bin Ja'far al-Qattani's relatives and a Sayyid Abdul Hay al-Qattani's relatives. In fact, his brother was killed by the king of Morocco at the time. So they were known to torture and kill ulama who called for a jihad against the French. So this is uh, something from Moroccan history. In fact, some of the Qattani ulama even faced imprisonment recently. Uh, someone says that apparently the Taliban leader saw the Prophet ﷺ in a dream. Now, I would warn against such type of things because in 2001, when the Bush administration invaded Afghanistan, there were rumors amongst the people that the Messenger of Allah ﷺ was seen in a dream riding towards Afghanistan and when questioned, he said, I am going to defend my children in Afghanistan. And a false rumor was spread that Osama bin Laden is Sayyid and uh, Mullah Umar is Sayyid, which is untrue. And it turned out that at that time, 20 years ago, Taliban was defeated. So I would warn people against dreams and uh, the proliferation of dreams, of stating dreams to justify something. In fact, we should always judge current politics with the Qur'an, the Sunnah, with the ahkam of the former dhahib, as well as the aql, the intellect. So Taliban can and must be criticized in all its faults. So if people point out that they carried out suicide bombings against civilians, if this is a fact, then that is condemnable. Likewise, any wrongdoing that the Taliban have done must be condemned. And similarly, for all the governments of the world, or all the groups, all governments and all groups today are not beyond criticism. So do not align yourself blindly to any one group or any one government. Have a critical mind and always judge things in accordance with the Quran, Sunnah. And I have to stress the former dhahib because the former dhahib have the correct interpretation of the Quran and the Sunnah. Because the Salafis would also, the pseudo-Salafis, also claim to follow the Qur'an and the Sunnah, but they lack correct understanding of the Qur'an and the Sunnah because they do not follow one of the four Sunni schools. So this blind fanaticism for any group is not approvable. Yes, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah has its tenets of faith listed in works like the Aqeedah of Imam al-Tahawi, rahimahullah, those things are etched in stone for us as Sunnis. But aside from that, groups and organizations are not beyond criticism. Which type of people will be with Al-Imam Al-Mahdi? Please tell because people are questioning about this very much. The response to that is very simple. They will be the Ubad and the Zuhad, worshippers and ascetics, the likes of the Abdal of Sham, the 40 Abdals of Sham, the likes of Sheikh Shukri al Luhafi, the likes of Sheikh Ahmad al Habbal, the likes of Sheikh Abdul Razak al Halabi, the likes of Sheikh Al Deep Kalas. These people were the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I saw with my eyes, and I believe the people who will accompany Al Imam al Mahdi will be similar type of people. What is your opinion on the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ mentioned he has left Qur'an and Sunnah and to follow, but a lot of shaykhs say it is actually Qur'an and Ahlul Bayt. The hadith, إِنِّي تَرَقْتُ فِيكُمُ الثَّقَلَيْنِ مَا إِن تَمَسَّكْتُمْ بِهِمَا مِنْ بَعْدِ لَنْ تَضِلُّ أَبَدًا Al-Qur'ana wa ahla bayti and wa'itrati is authentic, it's sahih, it's narrated by Imam Muslim in his Sahih, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I left the Qur'an, the Ahlul Bayt, and Itrati, my progeny, and which is Al-Imam Al-Hasan wal Hussein, radiallahu anhumah, who are the sources of guidance. We accept this hadith wholeheartedly because Sayyiduna Al-Imam Ali and Sayyiduna Al-Imam Al-Hasan 
and Sayyiduna Ali Imam al-Husayn and their offspring Imams from their offspring like uh, Sayyiduna Abdullah al-Mahad and Sayyiduna Al Imam Al Hassan Al Muthanna, and uh, uh, the, the progeny as you go down the lineage, and likewise Sayyiduna Al Imam Ja'far Al Sadiq, uh, prior to him Al Imam Zainul Al Abidin, radiyallahu anhum wa alayhim salam. All of these are the pure progeny of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, whose guidance we follow. Al Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah said, "Lola sanatan la halak al nu'man." If it were not for two years. Nu'man would have perished. These were the two years he spent with the Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. So our Hanafi school is the school of the Ahlul Bayt. Because Al-Imam Abu Hanifa, you go check his chain, it goes back to Al-Imam Ali radiallahu an. Likewise, his father, the father of Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, met Al-Imam Ali radiallahu an, who supplicated for him. And Al-Imam Abu Hanifa is the result of the supplication of Al-Imam Ali radiallahu an. And this is why the majority of the Ummah is Hanafi. So Al-Imam Abu Hanifa's school is representative of the school of Al-Imam Ali and the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt. So the Hadith, I have left for you the Quran and the ah- Ahl Bayti and Itrati is an authentic Hadith that we follow because we follow the progeny and the Ahlul Bayt of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Someone says, even though the Taliban is a part of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, but on multiple occasions they attack various dargahs of Sufi masters, what is your opinion and explanation for this? Again, as I said, the Taliban uh, have links with the Haqqani, the Obandis, uh, the Madrasa Haqqaniya. If they have actually attacked the shrines, this is wrong. And if they have banned the Mawlid and done any of these acts, this is totally wrong. And as I said, we do not blindly imitate any one single group. But the facts need to be verified. So many facts, I'm still verifying many facts. People should stay open-minded. Any wrong they do, they should be criticized. Do not fall into blind fanaticism like people fell into with regard to ISIS. Salam Shaykh, could you explain the hadith regarding the eclipses prior to the Mahdi arriving? And will the group from Khurasan conquer India or will it be another group of Muslims? The hadith of the two eclipses is narrated in the Sunan of Imam Daraqutni. Some have said the hadith is weak, but there will be two eclipses, one at the beginning and one in the middle of Ramadan. Uh, but the eclipses must go hand in hand with the other signs. So even Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani, the false claimant to prophethood, claimed eclipses in the month of Ramadan. I have refuted this in one of my books. But uh, the eclipses alone are not sufficient. There are other signs. So the signs that occur prior to that is, as I mentioned, the Euphrates River and the depository of gold or treasure being uncovered, which will lead to a war from in which from every 199 people will die. There is a hadith about a three sons of Caliph fighting each other. Is the hadith can be matched with today King Abdullah has three sons. Firstly, there is a hadith that mentions that three princes will fight for a gold. Uh, they will be the sons of a Khalifa, which is uh, Khalifa here means a, re- uh, a representative. It doesn't mean the technical Khalifa. It does not mean the technical Khalifa. It means someone who will be left behind in a successorship uh, or succession of kingship and three princes will fight. Now, the problem with the method some people have in eschatology is they make early predictions. The correct and precise methodology is wait for the sign to happen and you will know what it means. If you attempt to predict the future and exact signs or try to superimpose current events with hadith, you will always make mistakes. So when King Fahd died in 2004, some people were predicting the appearance of Imam Mahdi. They were absolutely wrong. 
15 years have gone, he has not appeared. Likewise, if people start stating now that the current king is the king that is meant, they will fall into error. The correct method is when the sign comes, you will know the correct interpretation. Why Taliban or similar groups or sheikhs do not promote progress, innovation, and modern technologies in the, in the Muslim world? Uh, firstly, the governments of the Muslim world are in fact, for the vast majority, secular. And it's the task of governments to fund science. So here in the UK, uh, me sitting in the masjid being a sheikh, I do not fund Birmingham University science projects and science research. Our British government funds the science projects with our tax money. So this question, in the past when Muslim sheikhs did promote technology, they were doing so because the sheikhs were the ones who were professors in the universities and the governments were funding them to research. So Al-Biruni and all these scientists you read about they were funded by the governments of that time. So expecting uh, m what people refer to as mullahs sit sitting in madrasas that are funded by the public, expecting them to make new inventions and scientific projects is naiveness. The secular Pakistanis must realize that your secular government of Zardari, of Benazir, of Nawaz Sharif, of Parvez Musharraf, of Zia, uh, well Zia wasn't secular, but all these various secular rulers, why didn't they fund scientific progress? They did to a degree. Uh, you had um, Bhutto, who funded the, even though he lost Bangladesh for Pakistan, which was East Pakistan, which was a critical part of Pakistan, but he funded the nuclear project. But uh, the, the responsibility falls on the shoulders of governments, not on the shoulders of sheikhs. So the Taliban government, after stability, should fund scientific projects. One final question and then we will finish for the night. During the last days of Imam al-Mahdi rule and early rule of Isa al-Islam, will Europeans become Muslim? What is mentioned is that when Sayyiduna Isa a.s. will descend, many of the Christians and Jews will adopt Islam. But what is mentioned there is with regard to Middle Eastern Jews and Middle Eastern Christians. Inshallah, we will stop here. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this a source of guidance. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa tubu ilayh. Jazallahu anna Sayyidina Muhammadan sallallahu alayhi wa sallam amahu ahluh. سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين